the Vox Markets podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research. It's Tuesday, the 20th of April, 2021. On the podcast day, Paul Hill discusses the clinical validation of Avacta's lateral flow test, which shows 100% clinical sensitivity. Also on the podcast, Glenn Goodman, former ITV News business correspondent and now the author of The Crypto Trader, covers this week's Bitcoin, blockchain, cryptocurrency news. We talk about the ridiculous valuations of uh, most cryptos and whether there's a rollover happening. We've been saying this for weeks, but uh, it looks like it's starting to happen. Plus, also on the podcast, I have two lists for you, the top five most followed companies on Vox Markets in the last 24 hours and the top five most Red RNS is too. By the way, you can check out both these lists at voxmarket.co.uk. We'll see lots of the content. In fact, there's, a, there's the individual podcast there, Paul Hill and myself talking about Avacta. There's an article on Gfinity, appoints former Apple executive board, second Apple heavyweight in the lot well, since December now. Uh, and I don't know any other companies like that that has a small cap AIM stock with two ex Apple heavyweights. Plus, 88 Energy. Pilot's Progress, uh, there's an article in Union Jack Oil as well, and Vector, and of course, our COVID-19 index. Biggest rise of the day, of course, is Avacta, up 10% at 258. Biggest faller, Hemogenics again, down 8% to uh, 3.5. Uh, check that out at voxmarkets.co.uk. Vox Markets is an online community of investors that runs a free mobile and desktop platform that allows you to track news and updates about any UK-listed company. Offering RNS push notifications, detailed charts, pricing data, and much more. Find out more at voxmarkets.co.uk forward slash app. And joining me on the podcast right now with breaking news. I'm so enthusiastic this morning. Paul Hill, equity analyst, full-time investor. You right, fella? Yeah, morning, Justin. i got to say, on Slack there, you said, we've got to talk about this. It's amazing news. Breaking news from Avacta. It's very big news. Big news. Huge news. Let's get it out there. Let's get it out there. I love your enthusiasm. What the, did you have any sleep last night, Paul? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, mate, this is absolutely... We've talked about it on our, um, on our fortnightly uh, video cast, that what the world needs in terms of sort of context is a breakthrough vaccines. It needs blockbuster testing and also needs therapeutics. And I think this morning we could well have got news on a game-changing um, testing um, uh, development so that's it's come a, out it's of the Yeah, it's a Vactor's lateral flow uh, test, antigen lateral flow test. It's been uh, passed all high clinical validation uh, for their platforms. So, so ex- explain what this is, essentially. What does it mean? Well, what, it, what it basically means, at the moment, the UK... Just um, Let's just use the UK as an example, yeah. but it equally applies the rest, of the, the rest of the world, and I'll come on to that later. But in the UK, we're currently doing, as of Sunday, I was just looking at the stats, we did uh, 1.5 million lateral flow tests in the UK. That was before the schools went back and before, I believe, Boris Johnson has offered everybody in the country um, the ability to have two lateral flow tests um, e- e- each week. But what we've got with this, the standard of testing so far is that the lateral flow test we're currently using are OK. Yeah. They don't have that many false positives, apparently, but they have lots of false negatives. And what that means is if somebody is infectious, and what you get is that when you catch COVID, then you have an incubation period. And in that incubation period, uh, you can carry it and transmit it, okay? Mm-hmm. And the answer to that is, unfortunately, is a lot of the rapid flow, rapid flow tests fail to pick up that. And, and why is that important even after we've had vaccinations? Well, frankly, what it happens is if you get a nasty variant circulating in the country that's incubating, you don't want people transmitting it and making it infectious because it's going to basically potentially harm people who have even been vaccinated. So what we need is a super accurate, sensitive and and specificity uh, test, i.e. that actually identifies accurately false positives, all the positives, true positives, and accurately, importantly, uh, true negatives. And this is the result that has come out from a factory. It basically said this morning, it's got, I think it was a 98%... 98% clinical sensitivity for samples, yeah. Yeah, 98% on the true positives, but 99% on the true pos- on the true negatives. I mean, that is just flabbergastingly good. I mean, what that says, it's, it's balanced. 
i.e. it does both, <laughs> and it does it within 20 minutes, which is, again, better than the, the standard of care, which is 30 minutes. And then equally, as I, you know, I just know from when I've spoken to um, CEO Alistair Smith before, it, it's easier to use because it uses the anterior part of the nasal passage rather than having to jam a swab really deep into your nose or, or to the back of your tonsils to be able to get a sample. So it's much easier for things like children to use as well. So this wins on all three of those counts, i.e. on accuracy, ease of use, and on speed. And what was also really interesting was that they did this in a European site in the test and challenged against two other existing lead tests and it had better results better accuracy than those two tests and why i think also it's significant in europe is because we come down to the ce mark when it comes to commercializing this is clearly something that europe desperately needs the uk needs it but the but the the, the europeans will bite your arm off for it because they're struggling to vaccinate their country and they want to get their economy up and operational like we do and they want to allow people to go on holiday and to socialize to go out to restaurants and they can't because they're in lockdown at the moment so what we're going to need going forward is a rapid super accurate easy to use lateral flow test and if i've seen anything which has come out of the results you know this morning this is it this so, so do they, do they have comp- and, and, and do they i mean in fact are at the forefront of this do they have a lot of competition in this area now or what yeah, of course they do. They have lots of competition, but they are the best in class. They That's just it. proved yeah, okay. that yeah, yeah. from this trial from two. They, they did a challenge test against two other, and they had better accuracy. And what it does, it, we're almost saying 100... And, and, they, and, 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 and Alistair mentions it in the announcement. For what is clinically defined as somebody who is infectious, they were actually... Yeah. Um, they would actually have sensitivity or accuracy of 100% yeah. for yeah. all that. So what we're saying is that if you want to go out to a nightclub, a bar or you want to go and watch a sporting event or whatever like that, you can absolutely test everybody going through that gate within 20 minutes or, b- or before they arrive, or whatever like that, that they are not infectious. They might still have, they might still be infected. That's still a possibility. But when it comes to transmitting, they're not going to transmit. So it means the safety of other people who are attending that event or at work is going to be assured. And that's why it's important, is that it gets the economy working again it gets people socializing holidaying partying going out and enjoying themselves and just the the volume of this yeah i mean if the when the schools go back we say we're doing 1.5 million lateral flow tests a day as of as of sunday the schools go back that's 20 million a week potentially of lateral flow tests plus any others and this is this could put the next steps are to get ce marking i was going to say wait, 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 how fast can they commercialize this now what happens where, well where do they i mean it's fast as uh, basically i'm i'm sure the government having seen these results want to get it as as fast as possible the, the partner they're using is mo logic mm. who frankly already have ce marking and have already used and manufacturing the the clear blue pregnancy test they're know how to do this that they, they, these guys are not sort of like you know just just johnny come lately these are a ve- very big and established firm who know how to manufacture it so the next step is just to finish off that ce marking and then to really launch into commercial and it all depends on how quickly they can ramp up but i mean alistair in the announcement said he's looking for sales i mean you know maybe maybe in may after the ce marking straight away which says to me even though there was no contracts announced that there's a lot of people of interest. I'm sure the government would take millions of these. Would take would, would, would take more volume of this because it's a British company, and most of the lateral flow tests I understand currently are being imported. They'll take it from day one as much volume as they can, as long as they can guarantee the manufacturing is consistent and the results are, are consistent going forward. And, the, and this is the this is the key: the results and the accuracy are absolutely there. And the, other, and the other bit of significance, which is great, it absolutely showcases the efficacy of Avactor's AFMA and reagent technology to the world, that this works as a, as a diagnostic, as a world-leading, best-in-class diagnostic. I mean, you can't get better publicity than this. And as I say, I think they could, I mean, they could sell probably every single lateral flow test that they can produce because, it, because the, big, the big benefits that this says to me, and this is why I think it's a game changer, is it's got 
almost 100% rate of accuracy for true negatives. That's meaning, for if you're infectious, we can guarantee that you're not, inf- you know, you're not infectious, yeah? That's absolutely brilliant, okay? That allows people to go into, into stadiums. It's easier to use, and it's quicker. I mean... I mean, I, I can't... What more do you need? Yeah, and, and do you know what, what stands out, actually? The pressure now on the government to get the economy open. Uh, did you see that Keir Starmer thing yesterday with that pub landlord? We yeah. Had a real, had a real go at him saying, listen, we are safe, get out of my pub and all that stuff. You can see the anger, the pent-up anger with uh, business owners. They want to open the economy, and this is the kind of... Uh, these kind of tests would help that, wouldn't it? You know? That was the Peggy Mitchell moment, wasn't it, for yeah. the Get out of my pub, yeah, yeah. But, um, <laughs> you know, that, that, but you can see the anger on the side of business owners that they want... They, they, they're, they're in trouble. You know, a lot of people are in trouble. They need to get the business open. And this is the yeah. kind of thing that would help that, wouldn't it, you know? Yeah, and I mean, let's be clear about it. If you have, a, if, you, if everybody is allowed a free lateral flow test each, you know, tw- two times each week, that'll give them, if they haven't got a COVID passport, that'll give them free remit into all these establishments because they just say, that we're, not in- we're not infectious. You know, we can actually go around and have a meal and we can go and have a coffee with our friends. We can go and have a drink and a beer and whatever it is safely. And, and, and as you say, you look at the UK population who, are, who could just buy these, the volume out immediately. Europe, Europe absolutely desperately needs it. And, and they've got sort of like five, six times more people in, in, in continental Europe than the UK. So the overseas licensing opportunities, and this is one of the significance, I think it was done at a European site, was because it then gives the manufacturers of lateral flow test for when it comes to royalties and to licensing it out, absolute 100% confidence that they can sell it to their governments, the German government, the French the Italian, the you know, basically the Belgium who are really struggling, the Polish, for instance, who are really struggling, all those sort of stuff. And 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 the, you know, the, 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 I mean, just give you a, you know, the sort of sense of numbers. I mean, I think they can probably ramp up, you know, um, volume into the millions very quickly. Mm. How into? Let's say, let's just, I'm just picking a number out of the air, but let's say they can do 10 million tests a month by, I don't know, I mean, hoping they can do it anyway, but, you know, let's say by late summer, so four to five months time, yeah? If they could do, if they could ever do, or six months, if they could do 10 million tests a month, that, I'm just getting again, the number out of the air, but broadly five pounds per test. That is, that is potentially 50 million pounds of revenue per month, per month coming to Avacta, just in the UK for selling those tests. I don't know what the gross margins will be, but I'll be stunned if they were less than 30%. Royalties, royalties overseas and licensing, I mean, you can just pick a number out of the air on that one. It could absolutely be enormous. What royalties? 50p per test, and they wouldn't have to do anything else. They could probably sell 100 million tests a month around the world at 50p a shot. Pure profit. I don't know. I'm just picking numbers out of the air, but you can just see... Why this is important, no, and why no, it's, it's so no, significant, huge, yeah. and why the share, why the shares have rightly risen ten to fifteen percent, yeah, just this morning on the back of it. Yeah, yeah, you know, no, it's uh, it's big news, and uh, I tell you what is infectious, Paul, is your, you know, your enthusiasm for it. I like that, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, of course, as we're going to say, listen, you know, it, 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 people, we don't know the figures yet, we don't know the contracts, but there's a lot of potential there, of course, if you are the best in class, and uh, we need to open up the economy, so it's, it's going to be quite. Yeah, big, well, so, I mean, uh, I mean, just, just, just yeah, you know, let's just have a read across to some of your investments, and I only do one, okay, and just as an example. Escape hunts. Yeah. This could game change their performance. This could allow people back into those venues. That's why it's important to investors like yourself that this works and gets deployed. Yeah, yeah. Every, every well, every you know, every business is not open yet, but it's hoping to open on on, on May the seventeenth. You know, this is potentially you know would, would guarantee that. You know, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's it's big. It's big for all the economy. Great, marvelous, Paul. Thanks for that, fella. And uh, yeah, we'll cheers, speak soon, fella. Bye bye. Bye. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waite. And joining me on the podcast right now is Glenn Goodman. He is the crypto trader. That was the crowd. So on yeah. Saturday, right, Saturday evening, I was looking at the Bitcoin chart. I said, can you see anything here? Uh, and uh, I did a weekly chart. And it looked to me like it needs to roll over. Uh, very rarely have I seen 
the RSI, the MACD running over on the weekly chart of that, where it hasn't had uh, a more prolonged downturn, all right? And then yeah. I went to bed, people argued me, said, oh, not argued, but, you know, hodlers, I see strength. And if you look at the weekly chart, it's, it's, it's nuts. It's risen so quickly, so fast, you know, above all the moving averages. It hasn't been like that before on a weekly chart. And um, I had the usual people saying it's strength, you know, and all that stuff. And then on Sunday, it dropped by 15%, didn't it? And then bounced back, bounced a little bit by 15%. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So, why, why did it sell off? There was a reason, wasn't there? A couple of reasons, I think. Oh, the reasons, the reasons. It's like the stock market, isn't it? People always come out with the crappy reasons, little yes. reasons for why things happen. Yeah. Uh, but there, there was nothing of true significance. This is. You know, as we've, as we, me and you have said before, this is a chart that has not been looking, you know, hugely strong for a while now. We've been worrying about it for weeks and we were right to worry. It is kind of rolling over a bit. It's far too early to say this is a market top because it hasn't formed a pattern that resembles a market top. Uh, but it may be in the process of forming one. I'm looking at the chart right now and there's, the, you know, the possibility, for example, that it could turn out to be a head and shoulders pattern. Looking at it, I'm, I'm you know, looking at it askance right now. There are, there are all kinds of chart patterns like the head and shoulders that may form in coming weeks that will start to look more bearish. But likewise, if you look at it another way, just to confuse matters, it could be seen as a, let's see, but as a kind of rising channel. Can yeah, you see yeah, a kind I, of I rising know, but, channel yeah, but, so know, that, that would potentially be bullish. Uh, hang on a second. I'm putting a weekly. I'm not looking at a weekly, right? Yeah. And now, very rarely has, uh, whenever it's gone, risen above, like, um, what's 80, what is it? In fact, it was 90 on the RSI. It's never done that before. Never, yeah. ever done that before. So even the last right. And when it's come down below 70, pretty much from that height, it's basically come down and gone sideways for a long time. And even the MACDs are rolling over at the RSI there. And, and uh, so what, what did I do? If it's top of the market, I bought some crypto. Of course you did. That, that, that was actually the, the best top sign that I'd seen. Yeah, I yeah. almost sold all my crypto at the very moment that I saw Justin do a tweet mm. saying, hey, everybody, what's what's a good undiscovered crypto I could buy? Do you know what's odd? Only, I, only I, I, you I, could yeah. look for an, a new undiscovered crypto at the peak of a speculative mania. You're asking for undiscovered gems. Do you know what I thought was odd, though? Is that I, um, so I asked that question. I thought, well, I didn't get any response in that. Turns out it was such a quite a big response there that... Uh, Twitter didn't show me it for a while. <laughs> I had to sort of look in there, and it, uh, uh, loads of people suggesting yeah, loads right. of stuff. Nuts. And, and, um, but you know, I did, this is my reasoning. I bought 10 cryptos, and I've still got them. Uh, right. uh, uh, District coin, whatever it's called, dear, let me just find out what they are. Went up by 500 quid straight away, so I sold uh, like 60%, so I sold 50% of that. Um, uh, but I bought, uh, this is what I bought, right? This is, and this is my reasoning. I got this. I got money in the bank. I can't put it in my ISA. I only, only use an ISA because uh, it's um, you have to pay tax, of course, on that on capital gains. So I got some money. Um, I, it's boring to sit in the bank. Really, is just boring to do nothing. And I buy some crypto. And my exposure to crypto of my total, I suppose, of my compared to my ISA is literally point less than point zero five percent, less than half of one percent. That's all it is. Yeah. So um, I bought ten different coins. I bought uh, Algorand or Alg Algo. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Numeria, NMR, NMR, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Anchor, New Cipher, uh, New Coin or NK, N, Engine Coin, which is uh, NFTs, um, fungible tokens, uh, yep. Orchid and District, District Ox. So I bought 10 of them, that, well, just 10% each pretty much, and just have them there because it's more entertaining to watch that than it is in my bank account. So I'm just going to sit there. And maybe, I don't know if I'll top up, I maybe mean, I'll just use that money there to see um, how, how, how well I can do with it. But I realise right now, I think, I've been saying it for a while, it's ridiculous, the valuations of all these coins. The cheapest one I've got there, I think, is um, that District Ox. And that did 50%. That's still valued. 
the market cap of that is still valued at 145 million. That's way above where I'd ever buy a stock at. And I think, what's that based on? I still think it's insane. And it, we seem, people seem to accept this. These, co- these co- companies, these coins, their valuation needs to come down by 95% before they'd be anywhere near realistic in value. And even then you could question it, you know? So we are in, really is, I think this is nuts where we are with Bitcoin at the moment and the cryptos, aren't you? Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, Dogecoin is a perfect example. I just I just um, gave a quick interview to f- uh, for a Forbes article that was just written. Hold on, I'm just going to find my quote. In this article, give me a sec. Yeah, no, what I'm saying is, and even I now hold, I mean, listen, I've got, it's, a, it's, a, it's not to earn a small chunk of money for, you know, by any standard, really, it's, not, it's a decent chunk, but it's, um, I still think it's insane. I still think they do a 95% sell off. Uh, it is. I, I mean, mean, well, they are, yeah. <laughs> Um, almost all of them. I mean, look, the problem is, as ever, that you can't put fundamental valuations on cryptocurrencies. Yeah, Not you at can, this though. stage you of can. the game. It's far too early. No, it's far too early in their development. You can't put any kind of... Not even on Bitcoin. You know, because it's... Uh, What's his, as we've well, said let's, a million let's times, try. what's let's, it being let's, used for at the moment? Let's, Not let's very try. much. Okay, let's try, for example. Let's try Let's try even the smallest one here. We've got 145 million market cap. How do they justify any earnings at all when it's an Ethereum token that powers a network of decentralized... It's all decentralized. I don't like decentralized. I like centralized. <laughs> Why is everyone banging on my decentralized? Big deal. Uh, I, I want centralized. Decentralized has its, has its benefits. In yeah, yeah, I know, but everyone's banging on us the new big thing, decentralized. Everything's decentralized. I like it centralized. Okay. <laughs> um, the token is required for applications to the district registry and is useful to signal support for disapproval for proposals made by network participants. What the heck? I don't know I don't what know. that. Uh, I don't know. Here's here's what I've just said about Doge for in that Forbes article. I said fifty Doge, which as of this morning is worth fifty billion dollars. Fifty billion dollars. Mm, I've it. said fifty billion dollar Doge removes any doubt that the current crypto boom is a classic speculative mania. I like speculative manias, Glenn says. I make money trading the volatility. But let's not pretend this is any kind of rational process of price discovery for Doge or for any other crypto. This is simply about people jumping blindly onto the next big thing. The true worth of every crypto will emerge in the long run, just as we see in the stock market. But in the short term, the market operates on pure hopium. By all means, have fun trading Doge, I say patronizingly to the readers. Have fun trading Doge, but I hope people take care a lot of money will be lost very fast by people who risk too much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm just in that little, you know, uh, I mean, I'm in it for a bit of game here. I expect a couple of bounces. And do you know what? I'm start, I should trust myself on the chart. It's going to take a lot longer because a lot of hype. And this is, is, is this a, you know, this tulip mania that happened before? Um, when, uh, what was that called? The tulip sort of uh, tulip crisis. Mania. Yeah, yeah. The tulip crisis where it just popped. And everyone just and, and, and b- selling uh, uh, in a baguette selling as buying baguettes buying and everyone, uh, everyone's hyped. Don't fear of missing out. It pushes it up and you get all these institutions. But like you say last week, they will sell. They don't know loyalty to you know the institutions are not hodlers. No, at they'll all. be out as soon all, as they think it's yeah, starting to crash. All they're about is quarterly on quarter sort of improvements. That's all they want to do. And if it starts showing, if it starts dragging down the performance of their, their quarterly book, they'll sell it. You know straight away. And um, I mean, the one, on. I would say, well, I would make one contrary point to that, uh, just regarding the tulip mania thing, which is that classic speculative bubbles like the tulip mania they burst, and then they don't they don't um, reinflate. Uh, or if they do, it's many, many years later. Yeah. Whereas what we've seen with Bitcoin in particular, but the whole of the cryptocurrency market, is a continual process of inflation bursting, inflation bursting. We've had about, uh, well, we've had a few of those just in the last sort of less than a decade uh, for Bitcoin. So that kind of gives me pause and makes me think, yes, there is you know, some kind of long-term price discovery thing 
going on here. This isn't just a simple no, I, no, I know that, tulip even, type even, mania. No, but even when we discover that price, it'll be nowhere near the value right now, especially for most of these coins. Like, there's a, I don't know, even on Coinbase, I mean, how, how many are there now? And Coinbase only tend to pick yeah. up the ones that seem to be a bit more sensible more, well, and have something, something about like them. like 1,700, I think, at the moment. Uh, well, tradable ones, yeah, but, um, yeah, no, I don't think there's that many, but there's, there's, a, there's, not, there's not many... They will do anything, you know. They will go, and so I don't see how they're anywhere near these values. It's just ridiculous, and I'm part of this ridiculousness. I bought into it right now. I'm feeling angry that I'm bought, bought into this hype. Oh, <laughs> I haven't really stick my house in it. Good, nowhere near. But I mean, uh, I shouldn't have even been. Got, I'm looking at the chart of Bitcoin. It's going to roll over. I'm looking, even on a daily chart, right? You look at the the strength now. It's down. RSI is down at forty. It's not been down here since. Um, 20th of September, uh, yeah, September t- n- n- 2020. So that was, uh, it fell off a cliff a little bit. Like I say, though, you could draw a couple of parallel lines on that chart right now, going back to uh, yeah, you know February happens, or though? so. And before you know it, you'd be looking at, you know, with a couple of parallel lines drawn on there, it actually starts to look like a bullish chart that's just having um, uh, the price sort of falling back down to the support level of the of the parallel lines. I'm talking about upward sloping parallel no, lines. No, I know. Can I say that? You might call like a flag we, pattern, yeah, something but like you, that. You, you know what happens, though, is that when you get a big sell-off and it yeah. drops again, you get um, – it, it, it's only just broken down over the 50-day moving average. No, it's not done that for like, uh, again, since um, a couple of years. Um, yeah. But – you get people leverage this on you, or, or stake too much, or bought the top, and they start selling, and then it starts tumbling. So it's like an avalanche, isn't it? And you start getting people following, the people selling, and you get all kinds of distressed positions falling out of bed here. And that, again, the avalanche gets bigger, snowballs get bigger, and it starts rolling down. I think this has got to go back down to uh, at least 30,000 uh, Bitcoin, tested to a moving average. And then maybe a bit of some bargain hunting, maybe. Let's have a look. I mean, yeah, you're quite right. That is a significant break below the 50-day moving average, which, it, as you say, it hasn't done since, well, since this boom began late last year. It is it is significant. I mean, I'm. it's one of those situations where we're in the purgatory phase, which is why I'm not prepared to kind of call it either way, because... Uh, like I say, you could, at a stretch, draw some lines that made it look like we're just at the lower end of a bullish range. But I'm more inclined, I have to say, to kind of be with you on this, that um, that this chart is looking more bearish than it is bullish for all kinds of reasons. Like you say, the RSI, the moving average, just, just the look of the chart itself, just the fact that it appears to be constructing what could be a head and shoulders pattern, which is bearish. It's uh, it's not looking great, but like I said, and did you see that uh, that tweet I did where I compared it to John Deere tractors? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. From 1936. Yeah. This was a fascinating discovery by um, by uh, a friend of mine, just like a just a novice trader. Uh, he was reading um, Shaybacker, the the classic technical analysis book from the 1930s that that I talk about in my book. That's why he bought that book because he'd seen it uh, talked about in when he read my book. And uh, and the thing about this chart that he found in there was it suddenly reminded him so much of the Bitcoin chart. And I looked at it and I've tweeted it. So if you have a look at my tweets, you'll see what I mean. Uh, it's, I, it's almost identical. Mm. So it's like John Deere tractors, 1936 Bitcoin, 2021. Whilst I'm not claiming there's anything weird and spooky about this. And, you know, we all know that, that, um, pans tend to repeat themselves quite a lot. Uh, over time, a human psychology makes the same patterns form time time and time again in ways that are kind of quite difficult to get your head around but make sense once you think quite deeply about it um and you'll see on the john deere uh chart that what happens is the price continues to fall from the point that you know if bitcoin follows it it will continue to fall from where we are now to say round about 35 40 thousand and then it will just kind of meander so up way upwards and sideways for a while. So the reason I the reason I posted that chart was just to remind people that 
you know, everybody, because we're in a kind of mania phase, everybody's expecting that now either Bitcoin's going to crash or it's going to recover and zoom to new heights immediately. But sometimes a chart of that construction just simply just meanders sideways for ages. And, and actually, th there's a reason for that, of course, which is that it's a very good way to shake out any kind of newcomers. All the, all the people, perhaps including yourself, Justin, maybe, who have only recently started buying stuff will quickly lose interest if the price just kind of meanders sideways for months and months yeah. and so that's what charts well no that's do. what i did last time i remember sick last time because I, I i did put a chunky lot in what last time i talked about bitcoin i did some you know videos on it like in, i think it was 2019 and the price was about yeah. ten thousand, eleven thousand. it didn't meander sideways for a while and i got bored but i had a, a bigger chunk in there then. yeah and you were really into argo blockchain yeah back, yeah so i had a bigger chunk in it then but now i don't have a huge chunk Chunk, but I thought, do you know what? I'm I'm quite confident that um, why did I say that I don't know that I could put in more money just putting my money in in cryptos and in a bank account for like the next five ten years. So I think uh, I think I think millions of people are thinking exactly like you are. That's that's yeah. the thing. But as soon you know, if Bitcoin, you see the thing is, if Bitcoin crashes now, then a lot of those newcomers, the ones who are thinking I can earn more than in my bank account will buy even more because they'll be thinking, oh, wow, it's a bargain now, it's a bargain. And if the Bitcoin price zooms upwards again, then again, people will buy because they'll be going, oh, it's all happening. I've got to get in quick, quick, quick. Um, but it's when charts meander sideways for months, that's when you can shake out, as I say, all the newcomers. And you need to shake out the newcomers if you want to have a sustainable big leg upwards because you basically want to kind of um, clear the clear the decks as it were get sweep it all clean just have the strong hands in there the people who have been holding for ages and then you can build a base on which to build a new sustainable uptrend that's how continuation patterns often work which is why you know you get those corrections that last for months and months and months in in, in shares obviously as well as in uh, cryptos because they shake out those weak hands and then you have a solid foundation for a recovery. So I guess what I'm saying is if if I were to choose between a crash, a a, uh, a, a zooming upwards, what do you call it, a rally, big rally, or a meandering sideways, I would choose the meandering sideways at the moment. I think that would be the most healthy development and it may be what we end up with. Yeah, yeah, uh, well, you know what? I'm going to retweet. Uh, now, that chart, there was, I, I stood a weekly one. I said, uh, I, I tweeted the chart below before Sunday's sell off. And now, even though I've bought some crypto since the drop, I'm not confident looking at the Bitcoin chart. Um, no, I, I don't know. Bitcoin, does it meander? It doesn't, does it? I mean, you know, I think. Well, it, it has been now. It's been meandering since February. So it's been meandering for exactly two months now. Uh, we're, we're at the levels that we were back in February. Not even the peak of where we were in February. Yeah, in February, it peaked no, to like no, fifty-eight thousand, no, fifty-eight and a half thousand. We're now at fifty-four and a half thousand. No, but it's, it's done for a big for, for, since the start of Feb. It, yeah. let's be honest, it was at literally thirty-six thousand. So it's, du it's almost doubled since Feb. It's not me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the no. I've said since the middle of Feb. I said for yeah. two months, two months, exactly two months. Yeah, but it's, it's not being uneventful. For example, on twenty-first of Feb, it's at fifty-seven, and then it went down to yeah, forty-four. Of course, not Bitcoin's never uneventful. Mm. But it's still meandering sideways, ultimately, isn't it? Look, since the if you look at since the middle of I would of Feb, not call that sideways. It's got, you? Uh, no, it's, uh, sideways is, is no volatility. It's jagged. It's like no, but it's, it's gone up and down oh, like a crazy. Oh, it's well, I, should have, I should have made it clear when I said sideways. I didn't mean no volatility. I didn't well, mean you it would necessarily say, go quiet. Yeah, but it could have gone up to a million. It will. You know, you'll get choppy action sideways. That's what usually happens when you get sideways, and that's actually it's the choppiness. That uh, that makes everybody leave the market. It makes everybody get sick of it, and and uh, all the short term traders throw the towel in because they're sick of trading a market that goes choppy up, choppy down, chop up, up down, up down, up down. Because it doesn't get them anywhere. It doesn't make them money, unless they're obviously day traders, in which case they can make money from those little chops. But but otherwise, no. Yeah, well, when I say sideways, I thought I mean just going sideways, but, but it's, it's volatile in between, you know. So. Um... So I'm yeah, saying, so what, I'm saying what I'm saying is, it may drop and rally. Sideways. It may drop and rally, and there's there's opportunity to get in, get in and out, in and out. Most people won't do. Oh, they probably just you know, drop and uh, they'll buy, it and then it'll rise. In fact, most people don't. It'll rise. People buy. It'll sell. They 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 they, they, they sell at the bottom. So um, yeah. I'd, oh, anyway, I just want, here's a quote. Here's a quote from. Uh, 
uh, from an article I wrote uh, about Dogecoin just before I forget. Uh, you know, just to hammer home that point about the $50 billion valuation. Here's a quote from the fa- co-founder of Dogecoin, the inventor, Jackson Palmer. The, the, two, the two inventors, neither of them have got much positive to say about it because they made it for a joke. It was a joke cryptocurrency that just happens to now have the patronage of a- Elon Musk, which is why it's doing so well. But uh, uh, Dogecoin co-founder Jackson Palmer said, uh, and he said this three years ago, he said, I think it says a lot about the state of the cryptocurrency space in general that a currency with a dog on it, which hasn't released a software update in over two years, has a $1 billion market cap. So that was $1 billion when he said that. It's now $50 billion. And to be fair, it has had a couple of small software updates since then, since he said that a couple of years ago. But, uh, but you know, it hasn't transformed the nature of the coin or anything remarkable like that. Uh, it's still an inflationary coin. This is actually one of the stupidest things about it, is that you know how the whole point of Bitcoin and why all the Bitcoin maximalists are obsessed with it is because it's a deflationary currency, that it doesn't, uh, you know, because smaller and smaller amounts of it are produced all the time. Mm-hmm. So it's the very opposite of money printing that the Federal Reserve and the Central central banks do. But Dogecoin is actually an inflationary currency because billions of it are created every single year and and will continue indefinitely for uh, to have billions and billions of it uh, just cr- continually be created. So it doesn't even have that kind of use case about it. Yeah. Uh, it I mean, some people say it's a lot easier to trade than Bitcoin. It is, I guess. It's a lot easier and cheaper to trade than Bitcoin. So theoretically, it's more likely in that sense to become a standard currency for transactions, for buying cups of coffee and so on. Uh, People tip in Dogecoin. You know, they give tips to people on websites and that kind of thing for their content. Um, So it could be useful in that sense. But there's a very big difference between could be useful and actually is being used by a large number of people widely. And it definitely isn't doing that. There's only small numbers of transactions being carried out with Dogecoin. And yet it's worth $50 billion, more than most major corporations. What are you going to do? Nuts, crazy nuts. And uh, in fact, I was saying, um, I said on a weekly webinar, I said about, someone asked me about um some crypto-related stuff. This was last Wednesday before I bought, but I said, I think it's going to blow up. I think it's insane, just the valuations. And uh, I said, you know, Coinbase coming to the market at 100 billion, pretty much, is also just, to me, suggests top of the market. Uh, but now you, you've, you've, caught, you've found a quote of someone saying that. Did, did you? Uh, say, basically saying what I said. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was John Authors, um, late of the Financial Times, now writes for Bloomberg. And he was basically saying that uh, the, that it kind of, yeah, like you said, that it kind of marks the top of the market. He was saying it's because um, once you start getting more excitement about the companies that make the picks and the shovels than you do about the companies that are actually mining the gold, then that generally marks the top of a market, he's saying. I'm not sure... I mean, he doesn't give evidence historically for that being true. And I haven't really heard that before. <laughs> but maybe it's true. Yeah. Me, I don't know. The guy's been around for a long time reviewing markets. So I'm not going to dismiss that idea. Is that true? Do we think that picks and shovels, that when people start getting interested in the companies that make the infrastructure? I mean, I suppose you could say it was true with regard to the internet boom, because do you remember in the dot-com boom, everybody got amazingly excited about Cisco systems because they made the the cables and the routers and all that stuff. They made the, the plumbing for the internet. And so their valuation went to insane levels and then absolutely plummeted. Yeah. Well, I, I, I know, I think... When it was everything. I remember when I first started sort of um, trading or investing. Trading it was back then. I didn't know what I was doing. But uh, it was when everything just changed to dot com and um, on the aim market and, and it would double overnight. It was nuts. And um, yeah, that's what's happening now. Everyone, everyone they can. Why didn't we just launch a coin then? Ah, uh, I should have done that years ago when people kept asking me to and offering me to and. Oh, why didn't I launch well, wait, wait for this my cra- own wait, wait terrible this, coin? Wait for this crash to happen now. And I'm then, just not then, interested. Then we'll, we'll launch one called the Rally Coin, shall we? 
and people say it'll, it'll rally, you know, or something called like that, you know. Moon coin. It's going to the moon. No, it's going to the moon. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly. Going to the moon coin. It's like if you call something moon coin, it just has to go to the moon, really, doesn't it? It would be silly for it not to. We'll call it buy this crypto. <laughs> Or call it like we talked about people, last week. People, the, the, uh, people talk to other people. Say, the venture that nobody shall know what it is, but to be of great advantage, yeah. like they had in the South Sea bubble. Yeah, but uh, have a look. If, you, if people talk to other people, say, say listen, have you had a look at uh, by this crypto? Say what? <laughs> by this crypto, or it's uh, it, or, or, or what did the, you say? I said buy this go- crypto. Or the next gold. You should buy the next gold. What do you mean? <laughs> the new call it the, the new Bitcoin. New gold. The new Bitcoin is what you want to call it. That's what you've got. Better uh, Bitcoin? No, no, the new Bitcoin. So listen, it's, it's a new Bitcoin. What is? All right. And the people say, yeah. the new Bitcoin. What's the new Bitcoin? The new Bitcoin is. <laughs> I say, what are you talking about? You should just buy the new Bitcoin. What is that? Yeah, just, it, just Google the yeah, new Bitcoin. Yeah, and people say, what, yeah, what is? And they'll find it. Yeah, say, what's the name of that? It's, it's the new Bitcoin. No, but what is the name of the new Bitcoin? It's the new Bitcoin. That's what it is. Oh, okay, I got you. Right. And everyone just talked about the new Bitcoin. See? Uh, I think uh, we got nailed on. I think we have. Make it super inflationary. I think we've done it. Yeah, make it super inflationary. And, uh, you know, just all the wrong things. And people just say it's hilarious. I think people just buy it, which is a bit... That's, that's, the, that's the thing, isn't it? That is it. Is I it? I just, just realised what's going on here. What's going on here? When the biggest joke in the market is doing the best, it's performing, outperforming everything else, that says there's no bigger signal of a bubble than that. Can we make a bigger joke than Do- Dogecoin, Right. If you can or can't, then who knows? But it's like, if you can and it does well, that just shows it's a complete farcical. Everything's farcical about this market. It's just, a, it's just a, everyone's taking the pee, aren't they? I know, I know. Well, that's why I keep, I, I can't take it seriously, which is why I keep buying it. And, you know, I've been I've been in Doge, I've sold Doge. I actually even went short on Doge at the top, at its, uh, not its current peak, because it's already reached a new one, but its previous peak, which was on, when was that, last last week, sometime on the 16th, so four days ago. Mm-hmm. It hit a massive peak of about 45 cents. Uh, and and I sold it short, and I made some good money because it fell. The price fell about twenty five percent or more, uh, more like more like thirty percent, thirty three percent. Yeah, about fell by about a third uh, initially, and then it fell even further. Then it practically halved in price, and now it's recovered almost back to the top, to where it was. So, as I said in an article I wrote about it last week, um, it's um, when you're shorting, you've got to be damn careful. I don't short very often, and when I do, I tend to get out very, very quickly because you get these ridiculous recoveries like the one that we've seen in Doge now. So that's why I closed my short quite quickly, took my profit. And uh, and and here it is back to all time high. So I would have, I would have, you know, had I held on for a few days, I would have lost all my money. That's why shorting is uh, is so dangerous. The volatility is usually insane when you're uh, when you're doing a big short. Mm-hmm. Okay, you, you, tw- you, 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 you Twitter open. You got open there? Uh yeah. Uh, okay, so I look at um, the chart there. But I'll DM you so you can get straight to it. But uh, if you look at uh, that tweet I just sent you there. You'll see that the, it's, it's, the steepness of that curve is nuts, and just uh, how we are now tipping over into the 50-day moving average, and just the thing—it's just a bit crazy, but crazy, crazy, crazy. I think, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Mm. It really is crazy, crazy, crazy. Are you kidding? Oh, someone, look just at sent, that. someone just sent me a. This is, people are insane. Someone just sent me. This is what I see, and they've yeah. they've, they've, they've done a picture. You know, I could try, you try and keep charts. Um, Look at someone just replied to me there, right? Have a look at the chart they've done there. I like to keep charts as simple as possible. I'll put a couple of moving averages on there and an RSI. Uh, but someone just tweeted me this. What the heck is that? What? what were they, oh, have you just sent it to me? Let's have a look. No, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 yeah. no, but someone just replied to me and click on that link they sent to me. If you want okay. to see a complex chart... Then have a look at what well, he does. Jarvi, right? 55. Click on that. It's like, are you. I, there was a, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I see it. I see it. Okay. Oh, my Lord. That's a lot of stuff going on there. We got some uh, Fibonacci. <laughs> we got some GAN fans or something. I don't know. We got all kinds of stuff going on there. Too much stuff. Yeah. 
too much stuff. It's not just also about the amount of stuff, but I mean, that's bad because in technical analysis, you have too much going on in your chart and it gets very confusing and you can't make any decisions. That's one of the problems. The other problem is that most technical analysis or what people it's, call it's technical analysis these days. Yeah, it is. It is it's trying to predict. Uh, you know, you I've can't done predict. a lot of research into these things to try and work out which which things have validity and which things don't. And the fact is the basic classical patterns as written down 100 years ago, the head and shoulders and the triangles and all that, they have validity because they're based on support and resistance levels. And you can do any amount of back testing using past market data to test whether these things work or not. And they do. Okay, they give you an edge in the market because they genuinely these levels that are breached with the patterns, um, the support and resistance levels do have genuine validity. And you do tend to get strong breakouts quite often through those levels, which give you an edge in trading. I don't know what chart you're saying. Fibonacci and the GAN and all the rest of it. There is very, very little, if any, academic support um, that they actually work. And the fact is, if they did work, you'd see any number of back tests by professional and amateurs going, look, here is my back test over 50 years of data for Fibonacci levels, and you will see that uh, you can make a profit using them. Uh, it's just not the so, case. I think some people put loads of stuff on the thing to try and show, show they, they know what they're doing, you know, they, they know all these different indicators. But all, when I use, you know, relative strength index and all that, I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's a measure of the price and the, how fast the price moves. So it's a real metric, you know? It's not a forecast, it's what's yeah. happening. Now, with moving averages, that you can look at the probability of it breaking a moving average, like a 50-day moving average, for example. It's not done that since September. So that says something. That's quite significant, the fact that it has broken down a little bit. That means the trend is breaking down a little bit because it's coming over that moving average, you know? Um, yeah. And so that's a real thing happening. When you put these forecasts on, it is like trying to predict the weather, really, without any... I mean, in fact, it's nowhere near as accurate as that, as trying to predict the weather, because uh, they've got proper models there that um, look at the satellites and stuff. But, you know, it's, 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 it is basically for, it's, it's fortune telling. Telling. You know, all you can go on is the metrics and, and what you're telling you, not what they're predicting. It's ridiculous that. So, uh, yeah, keep it simple. You know, keep it simple, stupid. But that's, like, the, uh, that's the phrase. It is. Do you know what? As humans, and we're finished. As humans, right? We are programmed, hardwired to complicate things, and the genius is in simplicity all the time because it, and I keep going back to this example of Google and the search engine do you remember they all flourished and they all competing for dominance you had Ask Jeeves you had you know Microsoft Network and all of them had, used to fill their page with lots of content you know articles videos whatever you may want to see this Google all they had was a white page with a search bar and search or I feel lucky that's it and even that there was one button too many probably and they won the war because they realized that's all people wanted to search they didn't want a pre-populated page suggesting loads of stuff even before you search for it you know, didn't yeah, they didn't that. want portals. Do you remember? It was yeah. always all about portals. We're creating Alta Vista is one of the world's most successful portals. Yeah, it's like people didn't want portals in the end. AOL, obviously, was the, the greatest example of a portal. It conquered America. You know, everybody was using AOL, America Online. And, yeah, they could give you a CD. You couldn't get it off your computer. It literally was yeah. on your computer. You couldn't get it off. The software, you couldn't get it off there. It's like, bloody hell, get this thing off. Um, I know. Anyway, and then it, yeah, marvelous, uh, Glenda. We'll soon see prices going down. I, I bought the exactly the wrong time. Uh, I need to be taught. Stick to me, you know. Stick to what you know about. And I don't know about. Um, luckily, I've not bought a huge amount, and uh, we'll see. Yeah. We will see. It'll all come out in the wash. Like I say, I'm like, still, like, yeah. I'm still kind of on the fence about. Uh, yeah, I think, I think sideways is where <laughs> sideways is where we're heading. You don't hear that very often from no. analysts, nice do you? To, nice to hear sideways. That. No, <laughs> I'm probably wrong. I'm yeah. probably wrong. I don't know. It's it's just all too crazy at the moment to be going around predicting direction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Marvel stuff. Thanks, Glenn. Speak next week. All right. See you then. Uh, okay, it's time for the top five most followed companies on Vox Markets in the last 24 hours. They are at five, Valerian Blockchain PLC, 29 pence on mover. At four, uh, Sirius Minerals, that's non mover at 14. At three, Argo Blockchain up uh, 4.8% to 141.5. At two, Avacta, go talk on the podcast, 10.47% uh, up, 258. And at one, iNexus has had a good rise. In fact, it's bagged over the last two days. So it's dropping a little bit here, 20% there uh, today, but it's a sell-off, bit of profit taken. 
maybe a bit of market makers movement as well. Uh, okay, time for the uh, top five most red RNSs. They are, of course, I'm saying of course a lot. I don't know why I'm saying that. Um, of course, it's a bit silly. Uh, five, Union Jack Oil, West Newton Update and Well Testing Program. At four, Director Share Purchase, that's uh, Vast Resources. At three, Omega Holdings, Notification of Major Holdings. At two, Letter to shareholders, related to proposed capital reorganisation and notice of general meeting, and at one, a VACTA clinical validation of their uh, lateral flow test there. That's it for the podcast. Thanks for listening. Much us appreciate. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice, and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research.